Hello, and welcome to episode 41 of Just Keep Writing. A podcast for writers, by writers, to keep you writing. I'm Marshall. I'm Nick. And I'm Will. How are we doing, guys? <laughs> Surviving the corona. Surviving. We're sort of writing. We're trying to stay sane, right? Uh, so... <laughs> I know it's been a weird day and I know we've been talking for a while. We had a writing group tonight and that's been going really well and I'm enjoying that quite a bit. Um, so, but we're here today to introduce our awesome interview with Sui Davies and that is what we're going to focus on, uh, talking about tonight with you guys, correct? Is that what we're doing? I don't know what we're doing. That's what we're doing. <laughs> sounds it was sounds like a plan to me. The interview went really, really well. So. Before we get to how it went for us and what we got out of it and why we enjoyed it, uh, is there anything else we need to cover housekeeping wise about the show or social media? Anything going on social media wise we need to tell people, Will? Yes. So, social media, uh, go to our Instagram at Just Keep Writing Podcast, where we do a book of the day. And we also like just drop little audio clips of the show for each episode moving forward and our patreon donate to patreon we're actually going to um open up a new level they don't know this yet so this oh, is news like, for everyone did we talk about this <laughs> now um in theory so in theory so at the hundred dollar level okay if you need a zoom class on hair and makeup you get to zoom with me for that whole entire hour and a half and we can go over makeup looks and hair looks and go over everything that you want to go over, even if it's just a one-time thing. Let me give you the list of people that I work with. Uh, Mary J. Blige, Missy Elliott, um, Jennifer Garner, uh, Atondo Akani uh, from Black Panther, if you didn't know that. Um, and a list of other celebrities that will be on my Instagram. So it's just a great way to uh, shape up a new look. Shoot. Nick, we don't have anything to offer anybody at hundred dollars, do we? <laughs> oh, look, I can offer anything at a hundred dollars. Doesn't mean it's worth it. I mean, I could. You know what? If we're gonna, will if we're gonna do this, I will hand paint four D and D minis for you guys for a hundred dollars. Uh, what do I, what would I do? Is there anything I can offer for a hundred bucks? Shoot, guys. I don't know, dude. You're really cool. I just think being in a room with you. Have a beer, pay, have a beer with me for an hour. I've actually paid thousands to do that. How about that? Have a beer with me for an hour. <laughs> I think that's great. Uh, I don't know. I love it. I, I want our Patreon to be awesome. I want more people. We've had some folks uh, donate, so thank you to those of you that do. And we want to give shout outs to those people on the next episode for sure. I want to I want to give some love to those folks. Um, so that's 100 percent what we're gonna do next time. We are gonna change our Patreon page. Uh, and put some stuff up there. So please, if you want to help support the show, please do that. And uh, shoot for hundred bucks, get your hair done by Will. Exactly, get your hair did, makeup, break out the tools. I'll take you through everything. I love it. That's what it. I do with my clients right now because everyone's at home. Do you need to learn how to cut your husband's hair? I'm your man. Do you need to learn to how to do a curling iron to your hair? I'm again your man. Okay, I'm diverse. I Any hair it. texture. Braiding. If you got effort textured hair and you want me to show you how to braid your hair, I got it. I can do everything. I'm gonna dread Marshall's hair when I see him next time. I can't wait. I'm gonna lock me, it. I still haven't done yeah. it since the last time. It needs to be done, yeah. man. 100. percent needs to happen. Yeah. You're gonna yeah, lock gonna, it. Yeah, I'm gonna lock it. Lock it up. I love it. All right. So, what else do we want to talk about housekeeping wise? So we've got no conventions really going on i was at a conference uh, virtually um a few weeks ago uh, i got my novel workshopped i think i alluded to this the last time we talked um on the toolbox episode definitely check out that episode as well uh, i think that was really good talking about critiques uh that's our latest episode episode 40 uh but this week guys we have our interview with sui uh and we did this a couple weeks ago it's coming out obviously as you're listening to this and so Takeaways from that, now that we've had time to digest it, I mean, the conversation itself was amazing, and we only talked for, what, an hour and a half after that, maybe? I know. Yeah, there was there, a lot of good stuff afterwards. I was kind of fired up. Off the record stuff. Oh, yeah, it was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> and and Sui's got a lot of stuff going on. He couldn't talk about all of it with us, but we allude to it towards mm -hmm. the end of the episode. Definitely um, chime into his social media, which we mentioned in the episode as well. 
follow him. He's got some awesome things going and read David Mogo God Hunter. If you haven't done so already, for sure. Hard. Yeah, it is a game changer. Uh, so guys, anything else we want to, I mean, we're just here to introduce. I mean, we've talked about hair. We've talked about not a whole lot, but anything else you want to talk about, about the interview before we get into it? There is some, actually, I should say this cause I did edit the episode, um, the last couple of days. Keep in mind, <laughs> there is some colorful language. <laughs> I, uh, I don't usually put this disclaimer out, but all of us were kind of in a, uh, in a mood, I think when we started talking. So there's some cuss words thrown around, nothing bad. Uh, but just, you know, if your kids are listening, maybe be aware of that. Yes. I mean, I'm not willing to admit anything at this point, but. I, Nick, I actually don't think you said any cuss words. I think it was me, the sailor. And Sui as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. At some oh, point yeah. he was talking Sorry. about something and I think he said shit like three times. So uh, no big deal. I'm not mad about it. And I loved having that conversation with him. And uh, I just want to put that disclaimer up because we didn't have anything else to say bad about this because there's nothing bad about it. No, it was, no, it was, it was a great episode. Loved, loved the interview with Sui. Sui is such a good person. Um, and again, if you're not following Sui, you need to. And if you have yet to read David Mogo God Hunter, you guys got to go pick it up. And where do you pick it up at, Will? Where, where's the best place to get this book? Where can they when go? You- when you go to justkeepwriting.com, uh, you can click on the link for Indie Bookbound, and you can um, order it through your local indie bookstore, and we're an affiliate, so the show gets credit, which that is just another way that you could help us out. Love it. I love Indie Bound, too. It's incredible. You get to support your local bookstores without having to go down there. Um, so as we're all cooped up, it's a good way to get in the next hit book that you want to pick up from one of our recommendations or one of the many other authors that you guys read and listen to. Yep. And the links are in the show notes for everything we mentioned during the show and our links to our website, which I think we might've said com earlier. I'm not sure, but it's .org, correct? Yes. Oh, it is .org? Yeah. Just, just keep writing .org. .org. When you said it, I was All like, right. wait, is it? And then I thought about it and no, it's, it's, it's .org. No big deal. Uh, we just want to make sure people get to the right place. Nice. All right. So without further ado, I guess we're getting in the interview, huh? Do it. So, and joining yeah, us this week is the author of David Mogo God Hunter, Sui Davies Okumboa. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks. <laughs> did, I, did I pronounce it wrong after all that? No, that's that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Score, well, we, appre- we appreciate Score. you being here. We got to chat with you on the boat last year for WXR, and that was wonderful. And it's just really nice to spend some more time with you and uh, talk about your work. So I'll let Will uh, take it away. Well, hey, don't forget Will and I met Sui at Futurescapes 2019. I was just talking about me, man. I know. You know, I just want (laughs) want to make sure this isn't just about you, Marshall. (laughs) It it always is about me. Come on, Nick. You know me. (laughs) Yeah, it was fun meeting all of you on the boat. It was really great fun. It was. I I hope you had a good time. It was. I I love that thing, and I really hope we can go back to it uh, next year. We're all fingers crossed that the world writes itself and we can cruise again in 2021. But we'll... I don't know. It's not looking too good right now, but that's that's something else. Hopefully it happens. Hopefully. All right, I'm going to I'm going to jump in with the questions. All right, do it. Um, describe your writing career in three words. Wow. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> I have never that feels like an examination question. Um, <laughs> let's see. In three words. Unusual uh Roller coaster, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and straddling. If I should use that word. Huh. Okay, so right. let's um, unpack those three words and talk about it. <laughs> those are you <laughs> really unique words to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so unusual. unusual bec- yeah, because my path to writing didn't come under the usual, you know. Um, I didn't, so first of all, I didn't start even reading science fiction or fantasy until I was an adult. Okay. Um, and, but that's what I write now. Strange. I know. Um, I grew up reading, my parents had a lot of bookshelves, but I pretty much read anything I could find. Um, and it was something, it was everything from religious literature to books by, um, African writers of the time, contemporary African writers, um, to stuff like the godfather or 
the matter is circle. Um, so it was just like everything I could lay my hands on. Um, and I didn't really get like, this is what I want to be doing until I was really an adult. I was like, okay, this is what I want to be reading. This is what I want to enjoy. Uh, and then even the writing kind of started out not with stories per se. It was mm -hmm. mostly um, other forms of writing in school and um, just like in my immediate society. And um, most of the things I think I really wanted to read or I couldn't get access to because of where I lived. I lived in Nigeria at the time. And a lot of my storytelling or my understanding of storytelling didn't come from writing. It came from oral history and TV. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it was like by the time I was ready to be a writer, I had like stuff from everywhere you know and i was like i had to start parsing through that to sort of decide upon what i wanted to do and then at the same time um my past my publication my first book uh, came after i had published short stories and all that but it didn't come via you know the typical you write a book you publish it you pitch an agent and then they sell it it came because i was working a full-time job at this um big um multi uh this global firm right mm -hmm. um that was like a proper nine to five um in lagos we call it a five to nine because that's actually the time you spend there um okay and yeah and so i was writing david mogul god hunter because i wanted to get two reasons one it was like soul sucking work and i needed uh <laughs> an escape <laughs> Yeah, uh, for and sure. I, I started writing David Mogul God Hunter as my escape. Uh, and the second thing is like, if you've ever heard about Lagos traffic, it's legendary, probably even worse than LA traffic. Um, so one of the things is if you close, um, if you get off from work at 5 p.m. in Lagos, it's not advisable to get in the, on the road to go home because you would probably spend like three hours plus just to get like a few k kilometers. So I usually used to chill between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m., which is when the traffic would subside before I go home. Uh -huh. um, and that's when I wrote David Mogul, pretty much. Between 5 and 9 every day, I'd like, well, I'm off work, and then, like, shut up, and then I, I'd go to the the breakout room, and then i start the second part of my day, which was writing <laughs> uh, my book. Yeah, and then while I was in the midst of that, my publisher, Rebellion, put out an open call for the first time in like five years or like six years, like which they never do. And they were like, hey, we're looking for new diverse stuff. You know, like they don't want to keep taking the same things. Anyone turn in something. Uh -huh. And I had like one third of that book done. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to turn turn in the first three chapters and a synopsis, which is what they asked for. And I turned it yeah. in. And, and then I forgot about it. I kept writing. And after like, let's see, I did that in like May and I got a response in like November. So it was like six-ish months. Mm -hmm. uh so i'd forgotten and then one day i was at work and i just opened up my personal email and i was like hey we love this we'd like to publish it um and i remember at work at wow. work that day i was like <laughs> screaming yes and everyone everyone was like you know it was like you know typical office there's like um, cubicles and folks were like who's uh -huh. who's who that dude what, what's what's he doing <laughs> and, and, and i was like Yo, folks, I'm about to start another life, you know. <laughs> so, that is you don't cool. Know of it. Yeah. So, um, and it's weird because I eventually left that company exactly in that month <laughs> and dove right into the writing life from then on. So it was a very um, non, you know, atypical path, especially because literally in the next year I joined. Um, the University of Arizona to complete an MFA program in creative writing, which is where I'm at now. Uh, mm -hmm. And that has also led to me teaching writing at the university. So it was like a huge switch. And by the way, I'm just going to point out that my bachelor's was in engineering. So that path is oh, has wow. zigzagged a bit. Yeah. So Talk about unusual, been, yeah. You're yeah. giving me a hope here. <laughs> I have a bachelor's yeah. in criminal justice. I'm not going to be a cop. So I don't want to do it myself. That's it. That's it. I, I worked in, in engineering for like all of like six months. And I was like, nope. So, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah so I've, I've been around a bit. I've worked in nonprofit. I uh, worked in consulting. I worked in graphic design. And, you know, pretty much. So, yeah, it's unusual in that way. It's like, all right, now this is what I think I'm going to do. The second word I used was what? Roller coaster. Roller coaster. 
roller coaster, yeah. Uh, and since 2018, everything that has moved like so fast that I've been struggling to catch up, right? I was like, wait, so I'm a novelist now? So I have to write other novels. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of it, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. So like I've been like trying to catch up because everything has just been moving so fast. Um, when David Mogul came out, um, there was like a lot of buzz that I did not expect because when I wrote that book, I didn't really think really hard about like what it was going to do. But there was like way more buzz than I expected. Uh, and everyone was like, oh. And then there were like interviews and, you know, come speak at stuff. I was like, speak? <laughs> you know? um and then there was just like a bunch of things uh, but the the most important one was my editor from the same house came back and was like hey yo i hope you're working on something else um because i was like because what <laughs> it was like because <laughs> you know you have to put something else out real soon and so i had this thing i was working on in 2016 NaNoWriMo, um which is what it has been announced now as the trilogy forthcoming from Orbit next year. Um, epic fantasy. I started in 2016. You know, I didn't write, I didn't win NaNoWriMo that year because I didn't get off the 50K words. Um, <laughs> but I just had like the, you know, idea put down and everything. Uh, and then once David Mogo was done, I was like, yo, I have to, you know. So I went back to that and I put it, pull it pulled it out and I started working on it. And then... Luckily for me, I had been thinking about pitching. Like I'd been reading a lot about like pitching agents and stuff like that. And I had that. Um, and so my editor came back and was like, do you have something? I was like, yes. And then I sent it to him. And within like a week, they sent an offer. I was like, okay. So I didn't have an agent. So I was like, all right, you know what? Let me go get an agent. <laughs> and then I will get back to you. So I used the offer, luckily for me, which is part of why this is unusual. I took the offer and used that to pitch to agents. I was like, hey, agents, wow. I already have an offer. I need you to represent me. <laughs> That's to work for me. <laughs> yeah, which was different from the typical, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I, I, I think I picked, pitched about seven to eight agents. Uh, I got... I got uh, offers of representation from two. I got um, requests to read from two. Uh, and I like one person or two didn't respond to me in time before I signed. They got back to me eventually with congratulations mm -hmm. and stuff. So um, I went with um, my agent, current agent, Eddie Schneider of the Jabberwocky Literary Agency because, okay. uh, yeah, because he was in the U.S. The other... Um, the other agent was also a big agent, but he he was in the UK. And I because I was in the US, I wanted a US agent more, more than any, you know, that was mostly the reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and that's how I signed. And then at the same time, um, the Orbit, who eventually bought the trilogy, was not even on the initial list to pitch the novel to. Uh, because, so when I got the, my agent, he was like... Um, are we just going to take this from this house or are we going to like pitch it to others as well? I was like, of course, pitch it to others. And then he, he said, he made up this list. Right. Um, <laughs> and then after making up the list, he was like, uh, and, and then this out of the blue, I had just published this story in apex. Uh, it was the last apex, um, uh, issue and so they got like a huge um sort of like readership for that issue and it turns out that the editor who bought my work at orbit read that story and was like wait who is this guy oh, that's and then cool. she, yeah and she, like <laughs> searched online i was like oh he just got an agent and then she emailed my agent i was like hey <laughs> do you have something you're trying to say he was like what do you know i have something <laughs> and, then he, <laughs> and then he pitched it to her as well and that's how we ended up with the nameless republic um Every fantasy trilogy. So roller coaster, as I said, um, ah. things moved in a way that I didn't expect and really fast. And yeah, and now and in 2020 has even been like way more of a roller coaster because like a bunch of stuff has just been happening, which I can't talk about, but um, even ah. more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats on all the stuff, man. That's yeah, wonderful. Exciting. It's really really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. I love hearing your success like that, where you get an offer before you even have an agent. Now, did that make it easy getting the agent part where you just like I already have an agent lined up or did you have to go research who you wanted to represent you? Well, uh, yeah. So luckily for me, I'd already be doing the research before, because once I was done with the um, first book, I was like, 
uh, I need to get an agent because I'm going to sell the next book, definitely. Mm -hmm. So I had already put, like, I already had, like, my research down. Um, I had my synopsis and stuff like that. So it was, like, when I, like, came with the offer, I already had, I just went out, like, literally the same day I pitched all all seven agents, I think, um, the same day mm -hmm. I got the offer because I was, like, well, I already have everything I need. But, yes, it did increase the turnaround time because right there in the subject, I was, like, you know, um, query with an offer uh, yeah. um, already in hand, <laughs> and yeah. and I guess that cha yeah that really hastens things up. Um, I got, uh, I think my current agent responded to me like the next day or like two days. <laughs> like that's it was amazing. a really short time. Yeah. Um, Dang, that's amazing. crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Again, unusual. <laughs> right. <laughs> Definitely, so, uh, definitely in an unusual note there. Sorry, well, I did, I had to jump in on that one and ask. No, um, I know you have a, a list yeah. of questions going on too. Yeah, well, we still have one more word to talk about too. We have straddling. Yeah, so. yeah. straddling. Yeah, yeah, straddling because because one of the things I never really thought I was going to be doing is uh, what I like to think of right now that I'm doing is straddling three continents because and I mean like in terms of readership and people who vibe with my work. Um, I, I, I think I've gotten readership from everywhere, but because I'm Nigerian, I, I get a lot of like, and I was part of like that, um, collective of writers before I, um, moved to the U S I, I get like a lot of, um, readership there. I get a lot of messages and there's tons of folks who like want to, you know, see what I'm doing and all of that. But because my publisher was up, my first publisher was also, UK based, I have also a lot of UK readership. And then because I live in the US, I also have a lot of US readership. And that's that's something I didn't really think I'd have to contend with, but it's something I have to like think about every day because I'm like, okay, I'm talking to these people, I'm talking to these people, I'm talking to these people. Um and and I guess because the US is also, you know, hugely multicultural, that has sort of like um snowballed into like some sort of global readership that again i didn't really quite anticipate and so now i'm starting to have to think about things more in a broad manner and think about how um the intersection of issues right um in a way that prior to that i was mostly thinking differently maybe in a more localized ish manner like you know where i'm from how does this affect the people um that i know that i grew up with but now i'm thinking okay how does this affect the people that i grew up with and i know but also all these people who uh, how how do these issues um, send, play out in the more global space and in these places where um, I have readership? So, yeah. To that point, do you feel that when you're writing, this is not even a question I wrote down. So when you're writing and you can get down to the mac the micro level of what interests you to writing, do you concentrate on that first and then worry later about how it plays out on the macro level? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, my stories at the core always start from everything I know, um, my own personal history, what I've um, engaged with. Um, luckily for me, because I grew up, I grew up in a university environment. My per my parents are both professors, so my outlook has always been sort of global in that way. In the way that I've, I'm always thinking about how this one thing um, also plays out on the macro level, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I guess with as a writer, you have to think about it even more, like in more depth. But when I'm thinking about the things I want to talk about, say the story ideas or the themes I want to explore, I actually still end up coming up from, you know, coming at them from what I know and in from a mm -hmm. more localized or micro perspective. And then that sort of, um, you know, when I'm, say, revising or even sometimes while I'm writing, I start to think about how they play out in, you know, um, on the, in a bigger, say, world scale. Uh, and that has started to become more and more pertinent, especially because um, not just as my work started, um, not just my work being read globally-ish, um, also because um, I have also, as a person, started to intersect more in a global sphere kind of way um, because of, like, all these places I've had to, like, be in physically at various mm -hmm. times. Um, and these these matters that say um, ordinarily wouldn't have been of particular interest to me are now. So a good example is I live in Tucson. Tucson is like not a lot of miles from the border. It's like twenty miles or so. Uh, and so border issues are like really big here. When I first moved to Tucson, I like I thought about borders, but not as much as I think about them now. Um, and so 
borders and and immigration and crossing and and you know the legalities around being in different spaces have started to like really be a big part of my work in a way that I didn't really think they would be, but they are now because I live in Tucson. Um, yeah. And I guess that will keep changing, you know, depending on where I am and what I'm in- engaging with or interacting with at various points in time. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about um, Nigeria and growing up, because I think from my experiences, so I've been in Nigeria and Kenya and uh, Zaire um, and South Africa. And there is this, on a Western side, idea of what people think Africa is, which is usually so far off of the actuality of what it actually is. So, you know, tell me about, you know, growing up and how it formed you as a storyteller and, you know, how you bring that into, you know, your worlds when you're world building. Yeah, I think about that a lot, about the fact that... um a lot of what I write might seem, um, what's the word? Might will definitely not line up with what a lot of people think about Africa to start with, uh, and not, and especially because we're talking Africa. That's like what fifty something countries. Um, yeah, so diverse. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and um, I'm just like from Nigeria. I'm from like one state in Nigeria. Nigeria has thirty six states, um, mm-hmm. and so like even. Even state to state, things differ. Um, the story I wrote in Lagos is definitely not going to play out that exact same way in another state, even within the country. So yeah, in, think, in thinking about world building, I guess, um, and how I present um, stories from, you know, from Nigeria or from Africa in general to the world, I'm, I, I think very specifically about the. I, I'm like. I'm a big fan of specificity. I'm like, where is this happening? Because something happening in Lagos, e.g. David Mogul God Hunter, is definitely going to be something, it's going to be different from the same thing happening like to a country away in Accra, Ghana, even if they are mm-hmm. literally neighbors, right? It's going to be very different. It's going to play out differently. And then the further you go, the more radically, you know, different that is, especially when you start switching zones, you know, um, West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, Central, um, North. And then sometimes even when you switch um, language barriers, because uh, a good example is like the two countries on both sides of Nigeria, are both French speaking, um, Cameroon and um, um, the Benin Republic and Togo, which are not mm-hmm. English speaking. So Nigeria is not even bordered on any side by an English speaking country, which means it's not going to be the same experience, right? Um, having the exact same story there. So it's not even close to a monolith. Like a monolith is so far away from what? a whole continent is <laughs> that yeah. right. just the idea of it is, is ridiculous to me. So um, it's like telling a story that happens in New Orleans and expecting it to be the same thing that happened in California. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Totally. So, and so that's what I think about every time I write, I think why this, you know, why here, why this specific story in this specific place. And then I think about how the events of those specific places will affect that story. When I'm talking, say secondary world, um, and I'm basing it on a place like um, the forthcoming Epic Fantasy Trilogy is based on 15th century West African um, empires, right? Oh, wow. um, okay. And it, it's sort of an amalgam of, men, you know, a combination of, you know, um, some of the more, what's the word, popular ones. But even then, I have to think about if I'm basing this particular part on, you know, something that happened at this time, how would this have played out based on how the people thought at the time, you know? Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about how things would have been influenced by the way the people specifically in that place think, what they believe in, um, what drives them, you know, what are the factors that, are, that decide how society is going to, you know, function, ETC. That's what I always think about in my stories. And I think I would do the same thing if, say, I lived 10 years in the U.S. and decided All right, I know enough about, say, this state to write a story about this state. I would think about the same thing. I'd be like, how would people in this city think? Mm-hmm. They're definitely not going to think the same as New Yorkers or Portland. Yeah. Or, you know? So sure. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I love that you said that because I think, just like to your point, people, when they think of Africa, they don't really – 
here in the West, okay, and I'm going to mainly say white people, okay, <laughs> the colonizers, please, okay, please, the colonizers please. are uh, going to think that like, oh, Africa, and like it's just one monolith, and like it's not at all. Yeah. Um, so that that was a great point that you made. Um, okay, so I want to switch gears for a minute. And sure. I want to talk about uh, a tweet that you um, – you had a thread that went super viral. <laughs> um, but did you I'm see just this gonna... coming, see? <laughs> <laughs> I did not. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to talk about it because what was interesting to me is I was having people who I've known for, like, years who don't write, who barely even read, um, retweet this tweet of yours through Facebook and everything. And I was like, that's suey. And I saw the tweet, and I thought it was just so eloquently um, – written and very of the time so if you don't mind i'm actually just gonna read the thread real quick for our listeners are you cool with wow. that i'm cool with that but okay <laughs> as someone from a country that has witnessed a civil war totalitarian leaders ethno-religious um pogroms state-sanctioned brutality and the slow eradication of human rights under the guise of criminality i can frankly tell americans you don't know what you're playing with the biggest mistake I see is people waiting for a big sign that tell them that things have gone too far. One big thing that police or lawmakers or the president and leaders will do that will cross the line. It'll never come because they won't cross it. They'll move the line. That line you think you stand behind is shifting every day with little actions, bills, legislations. Police murdering people on camera and not getting charged white supremacist threatening leadership, and getting a free pass. That line will stop moving one day, and it'll be too late. A frog doesn't know it's in hot water if the temperature is turned up little by little. By the time the frog realizes it's in boiling water, it's done. Dead. You're that frog. You think these measures and actions being taken are really about curbing crime, curbing looting, keeping protests peaceful? You think, surely it can't be about targeting black people. Surely it's simple about weeding out criminal entities. Surely not all police are bad. There is a reason the focus remains on looters and rioters and criminals when it's clear those are a significant minority of the protesting population. Even a monkey can see that. Ask yourself why punishments are being meted out to everyone, press and medics included. I could tell the story of how nonviolent agitators from eastern Nigeria were violently squashed by the Nigerian military, while other favored groups carried out daily pogroms and aren't labeled terrorists. Even when they're threatened open violence on the government, the playbook is old, guys. I save my energy because I have no space to worry over two countries. But I can say this for free. Every day, your sensitivity is being eroded by these willful atrocities. The envelope for what you'll accept is being pushed. One day, all these things will be your new normal. Remember how at the beginning of COVID-19, we were all, oh no, a pandemic. Quick, protect everyone. Then a fuck ton of people died and we were like, well, some people must die, though. That's you now. But with police brutality, white supremacy, and racist leadership. Do the work needed to fix up. Do it now. You think you have time, but you don't. Police in 50 states just don't behave like bastards for no reason. Protesters in 50 states aren't suddenly enemies of the country for nothing. Educate yourself and fix it now, or you'll be sorry. And then you were like, phew, this uh, thread ran away, away from me. Must mute for sanity. <laughs> if you're looking for ways to support Black Lives Matter's organizing communities, monetary and otherwise, this doc has a ton of links and resources, uh, which we will actually post in the show notes. Yeah, we will. But one, I want to really say uh, thank you for saying that. And I think you, you bring a great perspective um, of being someone who... Uh, is not from the States of what it looks like now that you're living in the States. So can we talk about like, you know, the reaction of the tweet and how you're feeling about it and how <laughs> you're just getting all of these followers. And I, I was just super excited for you. So. Oh yeah. Elaborate. It's uh, let's see. Where do I start? Um, I tweeted this in June. Okay. June it was a random day. It was just, I'm just going to point out that we're in August and this tweet still gets like today I got, so 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Since I'm just going to give you an example of how far the tweet got, like really far, so far that between June and August, I gained like 12,000 followers on Twitter. Wow. Whoa. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, an example. That's crazy. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. Um, I got folks from everywhere retweeting this. It, it was even like bigger on Instagram, right? Um, I'm just going to give you a few examples of how far this tweet. Um, and because like I took screenshots of the tweets and put them on Instagram as well, because that oh, day I was see. like, yeah, it was really big for me. I was like, um, I wanted everyone to see this, but I didn't even think it was going to go viral. It just did. Uh, and mm -hmm. then I got a ton of reactions from everyone. There were folks who would share something to me um, with me. And then I'd realize that the person who shared it was like some big ass Hollywood person. Like I, I got DMs from two actresses I particularly remember. Um, yeah. um, Stephanie Beatriz from Brooklyn Nine-Nine yep. and, yeah. um, and Kobe Smulders from The Avengers. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So it was, I was like, you know, I, I was like, what? Um, and it was just a bunch of things. Um, some people were like, they wanted to send me money. We're like, I want to support you. Send me your Venmo and stuff like that. You know? What? So yeah, they were talking about the Patreon. <laughs> we'll just make it happen. Okay? Dude, make it happen. Do this. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a very strange thing. I had my friends who were like, who would like see it somewhere or like peers in, especially Nigerian friends who would write, just see some random person and they'd be like, isn't that sweet? And then they'd text me and be like, is this you? Is this you? And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently, you know. Uh, and I think the biggest thing for me was um, there was a protest in New York, uh, in New York where that these tweets were actually read out. During, oh, wow. Yeah. That yeah. was where, that mm -hmm. was the biggest one for me. I was like, whoa, uh, and it what really even made it like more poignant is that it was raining that morning and yet they like showed up to protest and then they stopped like in the shade and in that intermission someone read out that string of tweets and there was like a video of it or something. So I guess I guess what I've been thinking about since then has been why this tweet? Right? Why this thread? Why did this hit home? So so I've been asking people that I know, I'm like, why do you think? Because I don't even know. Some, you know, most of the responses I've been getting, folks have been like, it's because you're a writer, so you know how to say these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but writers have been saying these things. So um, I think I think there was some part of it that, you know, just like Will said, that it's probably because it's like this perspective that's not navel gazing, right? It's not looking yeah. from its own self. It's like, I can tell you because I've been there. I've seen it, right? I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of these signs aren't strange. None of them is strange at all. Um, and I think where it, it, it uh, because as I said, I tweeted this in June, uh, it went viral for a bit, died down and then Portland happened. And then it blew up again because mm -hmm. it was like, well, this thing I said in June, here you are, it's starting to actually, you know, mm -hmm. take place. Um, and to be honest, as someone who has seen a lot of ele electoral violence, I can tell you for free that, um, with the way this dude is moving, you know, the way he's moving mad, it's definitely not going to end. Um, in just like one thing, there is always going to be something new that they're going to pull out between now and November. Um, the more desperate they get, the more the you know desperate the actions are going to be, and the more the fallout of those actions, especially when people are going to push back, because that's what's going to happen. Folks are not just going to take it lying down. Um, yeah. So, I guess it was just all of this that I was seeing, and I was thinking, well, in my head when I left Nigeria, I was like, yeah, I'm done with that shit. And then and now I'm like, nope, nope, I'm not done, apparently, because now I have to deal with this shit. Uh, and I, I think partially because it also affected me as um, someone living in the U.S., especially because I don't know if people know, but there have been like tiny little, you know, things that have been done just to make sure that immigration to the U.S. is almost like non-existent. Like, oh, yeah. I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm sure some, one or two have made the news, you know, like the one with ICE and international students, which affected me as well. But there have been others. Actually, it has been since like last year. They've been like, there's always been like one new one. There's always a new policy somewhere. And 
I think I've counted up to like six that have affected me so far in some way, distant, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. So I just it it was I was glad that uh, finally people could like, whoa, okay, this is scary. Now I have to wake up. I have to go vote. You know, I was glad that that happened. But I was same at the same time. I was like, but why did it take this long? Like, what what you know? Why did it take this long? You know. I ask myself that every day. <laughs> I think um, right now I'm taking an um, African-American history class from 1865 to present. And today we were talking about MacArthur in the 50s and yeah. about communism and about how they were saying, if you're not pro-America, pro-capitalism, um, you're basically they were going to blacklist you and everything. Right. What's fascinating is that our history is repeating itself in so many ways, and it is consistently tied to um, Black Americans, Mm -hmm. consistently, about stopping freedoms of Black people. And it is frustrating, you know, that, again, we have someone who is an instigator, but we're going to tear the system down it needs to be repaired like (laughs) no (laughs) like this is not okay and um you know black lives do matter and you know we need to create change so that's i think your tweet just went viral because it was eloquently said you are someone who comes from outside of the u.s but who lives in the u.s and i could not happen to a better person so i'm super happy for you (laughs) thanks (laughs) No, I'm just going to say, I appreciate what you did and what you said. And, and as a, as a black man living in a very small white community, like rural community, it's, it's every day. And when you tell people these things, they don't believe you and they don't understand. And then they gloss over these things in the news and, and that kind of thing. And it's like, but how many times does this have to keep happening before it, it, it it shifts, you know, and I think that's the frustration and where the anger is coming from and that kind of thing. And so I, I appreciate you and I, and, and your perspective, uh, for sure, especially as someone who came into this country, hoping to escape things like this. And now we're (laughs) here, we are again, you know, and we're like, Oh, sorry, buddy. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I'm 41 years old and, and, and I've been sharing these stories and stuff recently too. And it's like, I just don't, I, I don't get it. It's 2020 yet. Here we are still. And, you know, I, yeah. I don't know how, how many years have you been here now? In the um, States? This is my third year. Third year. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, you know, America. This is a, a, <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad you're here, Sui, but this is a terrible time to come to this country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. help either, man. <laughs> yeah. But we need, we need your spirit. We need we do. people who are going to um, speak up and, you know, and, and, you know, wake people up. And that takes many different forms. And I don't think there is a better way than to do it through narrative Absolutely, because stories create emotion. And when you have emotion, that's what people actually, you can give them facts and figures to your blue in the face, um, but it doesn't work um, unless you actually have a narrative and that's what you created. And I think that's amazing. I I mean, I'm coming from, the white conservative guy of the group here. He's the uh, wait, white guy what? <laughs> what? Oh, sorry, see. Uh, to me, your your tweet probably a lot, meant a lot more to me, my personal life and everything that I this been going on for me than it should have um, any other normal time. Like it's crazy right now. I you know I'm I'm talking to Will and Marshall almost every single day, and to me it was if it was anyone else that was already living in America who was born and raised in America, I may have ignored it. But the fact that you're coming from another place that's experienced it, that really like kind of woke me up a little bit. And I was like, okay, like Sui has something to say. Sui has seen it. Like, you know, it, it kind of made me dig a little deeper in a lot of issues and things like that. And you kind of just, I appreciate it for the fact that it, it brought my attention to things that I otherwise would have glossed over. Um, and I think, I think that's what we need, to be honest with you. You know, you mentioned, we're missing, you're bringing up a narrative about this. And it kind of ties back to what you were talking about earlier and what you were exposed to as a kid when it came to stories was it was a lot of oral history. Right. Um, it, it just ties that. I think everything you said was so well, probably because of your background. Um, the way you grew up and you guys, how you guys pass down oral history and stuff like that. 
So keep making these tweets. Keep having these threads. <laughs> I love it. Um, hopefully we can get some politicians that can actually do something better and not be so crazy. Yeah, it's well, the people. I, I, <laughs> yeah, we I, hope I, so. I mean, I, I was for a while. I was worried that I was like, "Do I need to hide?" Because you know, um, yeah. there there were some like follows I got that were, I, I got followed by someone from Fox News. I was like, "Wait, what?" Um, you know, <laughs> so for <laughs> we'll do a yeah, story yeah. on you. I did uh, so. I guess overall, what what I just hope is that um, um, one of the things I've learned at least being in America is that the, I think one of the um, it's nice to think that, you know, this is, uh, we're great, right? We're good. We're probably one of the best in the world, but it's also good to look out a bit because being so um, self-focused can also be very blinding, which is what I think part of the problem is, is like, we can't learn from everyone. Everyone needs to learn from us, but then you can't mm-hmm. see the, you know, um, the problems that creep up, especially when they've crept up literally tons of places outside america mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Um, well yeah. and that I'm, if it doesn't affect your everyday life people don't think about it yeah and, exactly. and, the, and we have to lead by example too if we're a leader on the on a world scale we also have to like respond to things like covid in a way that sets an example too and it's it's all just kind of deteriorating right now and so it's it's yeah. a very frustrating situation but i'm I, i'm so stoked that this work that this went the way it did for you see i gotta say yeah same. <laughs> so i want to transition because yeah, we have a couple I was gonna say, more let's questions switch gears or yep, we're run out i'm of gonna time. switch gears real quick but there's one sure. more um kind of i guess hot topic we're gonna talk about and then i want to talk about your book um okay. <laughs> i want to talk about the hugo awards for a minute um <laughs> because of everything just you know george r martin is an idiot um <laughs> let's just say it you know um but I thought also, I loved, again, a tweet that you put out that it, you were saying, you know, not everyone's experience in sci-fi or an introduction to sci-fi is Western-based, you know? And we need to stop creating this false narrative that um, all the old gar is what introduced you to science fiction. I mean, for me personally, I never even read half those dudes because they were boring and it was just white dudes. And I was like, all right, I don't even see myself or my friends or anything. So um, what were your thoughts on the Hugo? And let's go there. (laughs) Um, Let's see. (laughs) Okay. So I think, I think the Hugo's this. um, So Worldcon in general, I, this was my first Worldcon. Um, a lot of people told me, wow, dude, you're going to be seeing a lot of things. And I did see a lot of things. Um, but I guess I guess I'm, I, I decided to lay back on the criticism because I know this Worldcon must have been really tough to put together because it was virtual, because of COVID, because of so many things. Um, and so like, if, I was like, well, if anyone drops any balls, I'm going to you know, let it slide maybe just this one time um, or, or give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, Martin's approach was just wrong, I guess. Um, folks were already like not really happy about the whole retro thing. Where after we had like made these moves to like um, bring to the fore that uh, folks like Campbell or or um, Lovecraft um, were like problematic in their you know presentation of various things. And then we go ahead and give them like what retro Hugo's. It's just like why? Why would you do that? Um, yeah, exactly. that happened. Like, um, yeah. So I'm like, and then so folks are still bristling from that, and it's like read the room, right? That's not the time <laughs> to be like, all right. So now we're gonna talk about the old guard and like not pay attention to the fact that these people who are winning these awards today are literally writing against that thing that you're lo- lauding, right? The thing mm-hmm. that you're like, this was the good old days, is literally what the people who are winning have written about and are writing against. So, like, how how can those two even coexist in the same space without nuance, right? Which is where I think the problem is. Like, if Martin was discussing this as, all right, so I'm going to talk about, say, the people I read while growing up from my part of the world, my perspective, my canon. And then while I'm talking about how I enjoyed them, I'm also going to talk about how they have been problematic and how we should be thinking about moving forward from them. 
you know, like that kind of nuance would have been nice, right? And then folks would be like, okay, okay, I see what you see what you're saying. But just being like, oh no, you know, the good old days, man, come on. That's not <laughs> That's not what who we want to hear. Who, who was it good for? The white yeah, exactly, dude. Right? Like, yeah. Exactly, right? Like, exactly. Go fuck yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, and, and, this is, and this is even fun. Like, I, I, I didn't even want to say a lot because I'm like, I don't want to always be speaking like in all these things. But I think why I said that about canons is because, again, I grew up in Nigeria. I'm just like, when I was growing up, I didn't even have like books didn't even, it was difficult to import books. I could. I didn't even own comic books, for instance, because it was like so difficult to import them. I I started mm-hmm. reading comic books as an adult because that was the only time I could afford to get them on my own terms. Um, that's a good example. So how am I gonna have you know these folks as canon? I'm not gonna have that canon. My canon is my mm-hmm. grandma who told me stories. My canon yeah. is yeah my um you know the the uh, African writers who I read in in secondary school who who juxtaposed the realist and the spiritual. Um, my canon is is pretty much everyone who self published something um, in Nigeria at the time just to get through to the market. Those are the people who are my canon. Yeah. Um, so when folks come up and like, uh, have I read all the dunes? Of course not. I haven't read all the dunes. Why am I going to read all the dunes? Because <laughs> yeah. I, I have read my canon, and that's sufficient because that is yeah. science fiction and fantasy as well. Yeah. Regardless of the fact that you don't know, that's fine. Um, I don't know yours either. We're both good. We both tell stories. You, you, you. My, as far as my stories are, um, are accessible on the on the personal and on the you know universal level. Then I think that's sufficient. I don't. Um, and then maybe now, if I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna try and read a Dune. But then, if I already know, for instance, Fuck Dune. That, <laughs> <laughs> if I already know, for instance, right, like like Lovecraft is problematic. And then there's all these contemporary writers who have riffed off of um, Lovecraft, right? There's Victor Laval, there's um, N.K. Jemisin, mm-hmm. there's Cassandra mm-hmm. Paul. And I'm like, why do I have to read Lovecraft? I could just read these people. Read those people, yeah. 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 So that way I have the best of both worlds. Um, that's pretty much it. And that's what I've done because those are the people I have read. I have never read anything Lovecraftian, but I've read these people. And I'm like, oh, so that's what Lovecraftian means. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. That's good enough for me. Um, and I think that should be good enough for a ton of people, especially those who didn't come from these places? And we're, we're getting more of these voices. So I just think it's kind of like really, again, navel gazing to just be like, mm. so canon. I'm like, who's canon? Right. right? Um, where is this? What, what, whose canon is that? You know? Did yeah. you, so did you see Don Juan's song to post about that? No, uh, I didn't. On Twitter today. He, he had a post addressing that and where he pretty much said, you know, fuck canon, write what you want to write. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, Western culture does not have to dictate what you write. Yeah. Uh, and I thought it was super powerful. And I was just reading an update earlier from earlier today that Martin apologized through a blog that wasn't his own, but he said he he didn't get any pronunciation guides for these pre-recorded um, pieces. Whatever. He's mostly recorded. It's an excuse, and I'm tired of it. What he should have said <laughs> was, I'm exactly. sorry, I'm going to research, I'm going to do better, and I'm going to make a commitment to those people that I insulted. Exactly. Other than that, go fuck yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> Welcome to the show, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I just, what, what Martin did it was what I see wrong with our older generation altogether, politics, business, it's all wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and I wish people would say, Hey, I made a mistake. I need to do better. Here's mm-hmm. what I'm doing to be better. Yeah, uh, exactly. Because I think admitting fault and admitting that you made a mistake is probably one of the hardest things to do, but you gain people's trust and respect back every time yeah. you do it. Yeah. I mean, so unless you do it no one's day. perfect. Yeah. yeah. And okay. so my, my job on this show as I found a, a, a moment to speak here is to make sure we're okay on time and to wrap things up when we need to. So see, <laughs> do you have, do you have maybe five, 10 more minutes? We can ask you one more thing. I have more than five, 10 minutes. It's five. Okay. Okay. We just want to, we'd love to talk we to you about your book your time. really quickly. And then um, okay. I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, what you have coming as well. So um, go ahead, Will with um, David Mogo, then we can move on real quick. Yeah. So um Sui, tell us about David Mogo, God Hunter. Pitch it to us. <laughs> Let's see. Um, David Mogo, God Hunter, is in a few words about a God apocalypse in Lagos. Um, God apocalypse meaning it 
involve gods and it does involve the apocalypse. <laughs> um, uh-huh. uh, it's it's set about um, it's about a central character called David Mogo, who is a demigod um, and has to live in a Lagos that has seen um, the aftermath of a ton of gods falling to the city and sort of destabilizing everything. Um, and so it's uh, David sort of plays this in, you know, mediator role where he's like somewhere between both um, populations uh, that where the friction between them is kind of rising uh, for various reasons, economic, cultural. Um, and it sort of culminates when David takes up a, a job. Um, one of his jobs is to pretty much hunt gods uh, and take them out of places that they aren't supposed supposed to be in. And then he, he takes on this job to capture these very, powerful gods and um it's a bad job because everything really goes sideways from there because he realized he's just aided a maniac who wants to use those gods for more nefarious reasons mm-hmm. um yeah and so that's pretty much what david mogul god hunter is um but i guess one of the things that has really stood out so far that i didn't even think about while i was writing it was that folks really vibed with the world and how how realistic it was while also being very fantastical so um yeah that's my pitch <laughs> I yeah, love you that. do a really good job of grounding the reader in this real world with all these fantastical things going on around it. And I just, I love a good bounty hunter or assassin. Like I'm a big star Wars fan. So like, you know, it's like, you know, Han Solo goes off to do a thing and hopes he's doing the right thing and then gets caught up in something bigger. And I just, I love this story, man. I just, I, I know we don't have a ton of time to talk about it. I just, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I, I love how grounded it is and while being amazingly fantastic at the same time. I'm glad. <laughs> Yeah, we all loved it. Um, I've read it four times so far, so um, no. I'm obs- yeah. <laughs> I do. He's a I book do that. <laughs> yeah, well, I do one that. Of those guys will just keep reading a book over and over. And I'm like, I just, I'm just stoked. I read it one time, man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to reread it again before, like, we were going to talk. So I read it yesterday, and I yeah. made notes and everything. I love it. I mean, I could talk to you for hours about it. Um, but we don't have hours. So I'm going to go to our next question. Um, what inspired you to write the story? Like how, how did it come to you basically? So first of all, again, because I was in a soul sucking job, so I reiterate (laughs) that. Um, but also, um, because a few things, one of them was immigration in a very local sense, funny enough, because Lagos is one of those uh, cities in, in Nigeria. Lagos is pretty much where everyone goes in Nigeria. It's like when you finish, when you, you're, it's like New York, right? You grow up and then you're like, all right, I'm going to move to the big city. And it's always Lagos. Um, yeah. And so there have been talks even like by various governors of the state being like, we have to curb immigration. <laughs> you know, it's weird that that's being in, in the same country. It's weird. But yeah, they're like, yeah, we can't just let anyone else in anymore. And so there have been various things floated. None of them have worked. People still show up in Lagos all the time. Um, And so I I was thinking about um, that and also thinking about the fact that um, Nigeria as a whole is just like a country held together by like tape. Um, And Lagos is like the epitome of that. It's like the it's like a city that's always looks like it always looks like it's broken, breaking or about to break, but never does any of those three. Um, mm-hmm. It's just always like in stasis, somewhere in, in between. It's like, oh, Lagos is so bad, but like no one leaves and everyone just keeps coming there. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the things I kept thinking about was like, okay, so what is it going to take for this city to actually break, you know? Um, and and so it was like the combination of those two things. I was like, all right, if there's a, like a mass ton of like folks dropping into the city at once, is it going to like put so much of a strain on everything that it's going to collapse. Uh, and then I just thought, so instead of people, why not gods? Um, <laughs> and then why not? That's pretty, <laughs> yeah. And then put those two together and pretty much you have David. And we'll go God that's awesome. I, I love, love it. it. <laughs> Nick, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. So I reread the first chapter today. Um, and your first chapter really sets up this unique blend that you did of your own personal world building and the world that you lived in. Right. Right. Can you kind of walk me through that a little bit of your world building? Like, how did you exactly do that? How did you figure out what to keep and what to get rid of as far as the real world goes? And then how did you supplement that? Cause you, you have an apocalypse is about to happen. Logos is, you know, they they're suffering. Right. 
Right. Um, let's see. So I, I I started by really thinking about what uh, I think two things. One, which is what a collapse Lagos would look like. Um, newsflash, not very different from what it currently is. Um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, like a ton of folks are like, oh, it's a dystopia. I'm like, what? It's not a dystopia. It's just like, that's literally what Lagos is. Um, <laughs> and like then, that's the city. <laughs> yeah. So like, it, it doesn't change too much, which is not, so like really the, the most, the things I really had to do a lot of, you know, making up were like with the gods and fantastical aspects, right? Powers and stuff like that. But the actual Lagos, I just thought, well, what about, what, you know, how could I, if this place was without people, I think that's just as much as I went. I was like, if this one place that I already know and see was without people, what would it look like? Uh, and it was literally the exact places I'd been to in Lagos that I, uh, I, I didn't even, I, I didn't grow up in Lagos. I wasn't born in Lagos. I moved to Lagos when I was in my twenties and I, I lived there for like five years, but I lived there. I, I moved around enough to know it like very well in that way. Um, and then, and then for the world, for the rest of the world building, I, I, I wrote about this at, and I think the SFWA, um, where I talked about how I just extrapolated from, from this one event, which was you have Lagos and then you have gods descending. What happens? So it was like everything else. How does the government react? How do the people react? How do religious people mm-hmm. react? How do people who are just striving for daily bread react? How do people who say where used to believe in these gods or, you know, venerate these gods? Like, Aha, we were right. Right. And, and then they, be, they become the wizards, you know, ETC. How do people who want to protect themselves? Um, so a good example is like there's a good there's a huge ton of like uh, immigrants in from Middle East and um, Europe in Nigeria, right? How do they do they keep living there? Do they move somewhere else? How do the one percent handle that? Do they move the whole? Which in the book actually they pretty much start a new Lagos somewhere else. They're like, all right, we're just gonna leave that city for you guys. We're gonna be over here, mm-hmm. um, you know. So those are all the things I really just asked um and but some of the questions i really asked were like things um especially questions that had to do with the socioeconomic response um what's the economy going to be like because there's folks who are not going to leave they're like gods well i have nowhere else to go so i might as well be here uh, and then there's folks who's living next you know, door to these gods um there are folks who are trying to make a business out of it david mogo included mm-hmm. um <laughs> and and so it's just like all these things i really just thought about and then I thought about how the exact uh, how that would play out exactly based on the Nigerians that I know and the Lagosians that I know, um, and that's pretty much it. I didn't think too much. Uh, I thought about the magic system for a bit, but again, I drew on those systems based on the pantheon um, mm-hmm. of gods that I drew from, which is the um, Yoruba pantheon of Orishas, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, now is that I, is that the same as? Uh, Children of Blood and Bone with Tommy Adayami, if I said that right. Mm, uh, yes, you said that right. Um, let's see, not quite because Tommy Ade. So uh, this is not shade, but Tommy Adayami's <laughs> um, book actually draws way more from the Orisha mythology of South America yeah. than mm-hmm. West right. Africa. Okay. Because yes, yeah, though the the South American myth, um, Orisha. Um, which has been called very uh, various things, um, it, but I think it's called candomble. Um, and you, you'd uh, let's see. So, so the some things are different, right? The naming system, some of the letters um, that don't exist in in West African and Yoruba Yoruba alphabets, for instance. Um, so stuff like that. But some things, a lot of things are are similar because the religion is actually taking there. Uh, via slave trade from West Africa to the East Coast of South America. So Cuba, Brazil, you'd see a lot of folks practice um, um, veneration of the Orishas there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so it crosses over. It's the same thing, um, but different in other ways. Um, But yeah, powers are pretty much the same. Um, The gods are pretty much the same in in their manifestations. And so the the magic system that I did was pretty much drawing from that and the practices that people already use to venerate these gods. And so invoking them, you know, um, drawing words. Um, and so I think the one magic thing I really brought out was like, oh, the physical manifestation of the magic. Like how does someone like wield fire and stuff like that? That, right. that was the only yeah. part I, I really drew out. Everything else from incantations um, 
um, from invoking gods and stuff like that. All of that was stuff that was already existent. Um, it is still existent till today. There are parts of the west of Nigeria where you'd go to, and that's they have festivals to Orishas. Um, and I did some research on that. I spoke to some people. I did a, a lot of um, book research, which is not a lot, um, especially when I was trying to avoid all the ones written by colonial influences. <laughs> yeah, influences. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no colonial so, influences needed. Yeah. So I, I just like skipped all of those and only read um, and looked at stuff that came from indigenous scholars. Um, I spoke to people. My wife is Yoruba. Um, and um, so I spoke to people within my um what's the word networks and stuff like that so yeah. that was how i pretty much put all of that together now so follow-up question will is that okay what, you may one, do it. I'll, I'll give you one more <laughs> oh thanks guys <laughs> um so follow-up question when it comes to the the world building aspect um i love your guys your use of dialogue and how you incorporate dialect where you're from Right. Now, you, you earlier you mentioned this intersectionality of three different continents. Right. Did that come into play that if you wanted to write it like a standard westernized novel where it's proper English, quote unquote? Yeah. Or did you it was that something on your mind or was it just, hey, this is I know I'm in Africa. This is how we talk. This is what where I'm going with. Yeah. So because I started it as a sort of escapist project. It was mm -hmm. not on my mind while I was writing it. I was like, well, I'm just going to tell. I, so I, I, to be honest, when I wrote it, I just thought I was writing for like Nigerians, my friends, my the people who I know who read stuff like this. That's it. That's all I kept thinking. So I was like, of course, I'm going to represent everything as is. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the only time when I started to think about that was when I sold the book and then, you know, it got this like, you know, I was like, oh, wait, now I have to think about the fact that someone from, say, you know, somewhere in Asia is probably going to be hearing about these, this, this pantheon, this city for the first time ever in their lives. At the same time, that someone who has been familiar with this their whole life is going to be reading this book. So, like, how do I bridge that? Um, that's <laughs> really the one question I asked myself. How do I present this in a way that someone who has always lived with this is not going to find it alienating and like, is this for me? Uh, while someone who's seeing this for the first time is also going to be like, mm, can I understand this? Um, and I don't think there's really any easy answer to that, to be honest. Um, it's always going to yeah. lean one way or the other. And, and so what I told my editor from the beginning was like, look, I am going to lean the way of verisimilitude. I'm going to lean the way of presenting it as it is that's how we speak that's who we are that's what's going to get mm -hmm. on the page um if you're going to publish this then you're going to have to deal with that and luckily my editor was like such a swell guy he was like yep let's do it i'm 100 percent <laughs> of board um the marketing team was like 100 percent of board they're like yeah let's let's put it forward in that way uh and yeah i still tried as much i was like all right so there are some things i have to explain not just because i was thinking globally but also because nigeria itself is very diverse and there are a bunch of people from other states in the country who will need explanations to understand some of the terms and, you know, some things I said. And that's really, you know, how I went about it. No, I, I love it. I personally am a big fan of the use of dialect the way you did it. Um, I think we need more of it personally. Mm -hmm. So keep doing it like that. I can't speak more about that than what I have. So. Well, do you have any other questions? I just wanted, since you talked about it earlier on, I just wanted you to, if you can talk about it, um, talk about your upcoming books and um, where people can uh, stay up with you and, and see what you got coming. Yeah. Okay. So my forthcoming work, um, I have an epic fantasy trilogy forthcoming from Orbit. It's called The Nameless Republic for the series title. We're yet to release information about the first book, but it's going to be out in summer 2021. Um, let's just say I have seen cover art and it is massive. <laughs> it, is, it is dope. Okay. Uh, I just have to drop that. Yeah. It, it is dope even for me. So, um, <laughs> I love it. And the, and the cover on your book I got in front of me is amazing too. So I can't wait, man. <laughs> yeah. I just, I feel like I'm locking out on covers, you know, I'm just, I've just locked out. I really locked out. Um, so yeah, it is an epic fantasy. Um, as I said earlier, it's based on 15th century West African empires. Um, and that's what the world is based on. Um, and it pretty much just follows a, a scholar who gets to meet, who gets to be the first to leave the city where he's been like 
you know, cocooned within and gets to sort of interact with other parts of the world and find out, of course, that um, everything he's been told is a lie. So awesome. just think about it like some, as someone, you know, living in America for the first time and going to Africa and be like, oh, <laughs> that's not what I was told. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, pretty much that. Um, um, let's see. I have... Ugh, what can I talk about? <laughs> you have a com- wait. You're well, you're writing some comics, right? So yes, I did release a comic with um, 2000 AD. They're the publishers of uh, the Judge Dread, um, oh, really? and uh, yeah, it was um, a, it, it was a comic called My Tech the Mighty. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 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 a revived character from the 1970s that has again colonial backgrounds. Um, <laughs> it, it's about uh solar powered robot gorilla um that arose from um africa um of course the people who wrote it then had very different views about what that solar powered gorilla was supposed to be yeah <laughs> and so now um i was i was um commissioned to rewrite it to sort of give it a new spin and a less racist spin um so, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's probably best. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you, you put it bluntly. <laughs> yeah. Again, fucking colonizers. <laughs> yeah, white people. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, that came out in May. Um, it was part of a collection called Smash Special uh, from 2080. So if you look it up, you'd see my tech, the mighty issue one. Um, and I had a, co- a bunch of, I had a team of co-creators as well the artists and inkers and dope folks uh, and it was great it was fun writing because i got to write my uh, the university i went to at the in nigeria into the story so it was awesome uh, <laughs> oh, sounds awesome <laughs> yeah it was great uh let's see so uh that's what i had just coming out recently um but I now that I think about it, I don't think there's anything that's forthcoming that I can actually talk about <laughs> yet. So, but well, I do have <laughs> a, a number of things coming forth um, that will be announced. Um, everything from books to stories to appearances in um, to story appearances in places um, that I also can't name. <laughs> when, hey, whenever that drops, you're allowed to say it. Just tag us because we want to let everyone else know too. <laughs> Yeah, we, sure, we, we'd love to have you back on and chat with, chat with you again when you have your other stuff going out and you can't talk about it, man. It's, it's always good to chat with you. So Definitely. Same here. Guys. <laughs> so um, if there's not, anything else, guys, I'm aware of the time now. I'm putting no, the pressure silly. on you. Do you want to you tell everyone your um, like Instagram handle, your Twitter handle, and your Patreon account? Oh, great. Um, so I do not have a Patreon. I have a Substack, though, which I am, which is going to go paid soon. So that's going to be great. Um, okay, well. So you can just find it at sui.substack.com. Um, great. Uh, my website is at suidavis.com, which you can find links to everything else. But uh, at on Twitter, I'm, I'm at I am Sui Davis. Uh, and on Twitter, I'm just, I'm sorry, on Instagram, I'm just Sui Davis. Um, so yeah, you can find me on all these places. Awesome. I, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. So it was awesome to talk to you again and um, best of luck with all, all the stuff you got going on for sure. 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 This is always a pleasant time to talk with you guys. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been just keep writing a podcast for writers by writers to keep you writing. Check out our website at just You can find links to our social media and discord channel in the show notes, as well as any other links mentioned during the show. If you want to support the show, the best way to do that is patreon.com slash just keep writing. Thanks for listening. Now just keep writing.